Merry Christmas um, from Storm the Culture. Welcome to Lit for Fifth Generation Warriors because God knows you need it. <laughs> and um, it's snowing in the mountain cabin getaway. Uh, so there's no, no perfect time for a good story. Um, why do fifth generation warriors need literature? When you're sitting in front of your tell a vision, um, you're in a passive, semi hypnotic state. It's like Ranger TV on steroids. You don't get to interject, ask questions. Um, you are either accepting or not accepting whatever is being fed to you. And <clears throat> if you understand that and you look behind the screen of um, movies and also understand literary constructs, you'll be able to um, know when to appreciate the art and the message and when to protect yourself and your family from social engineering. Um, some of us are old enough to remember the 70s and the 70s was an era of car chases and rape scenes. And when you went to the theater, you could pretty much um, count on being accosted. Um, there are some, you know, Billy Jack stands out in my memory, but there were plenty of very violent, um, movies with women in um, extremely rough roles and I'm not saying that the pendulum hasn't swung too far in the opposite direction because it certainly has but um, it was not a case of um, art imitating life it was a case of art trying to traumatize a populace. The more um, stressed and anxiety ridden a people are, the more easily led they are. And um, it's up to us to determine whether that is what's going on or not. So um, let's start with a short story uh, called 310 to Yuma. <laughs> it was written by Elmore Leonard and I am a firm believer in having long form videos playing in the background while I do something else. So, you know, you can hand load your ammo, you can make bread, put up preserves, whatever it is that you like to do that's constructive of your time and have me playing in the background. There's no need to watch my radio made visage. Um, this is the book. I'll show you this and after this you don't have to watch any more, but this is um, the complete Western stories of Elmore Leonard and it was published in 2004 by HarperCollins. It's a huge volume um, and there are sh 30 short stories in there. If you get the audio version, you'll only hear 11. One of them, though, is 310 to Yuma, and if I hadn't listened to the audio version, I might have missed something. So sometimes um, having both forms is uh, a good idea. I would always have the print form, no matter what. Um, digital versions of short stories, of long stories, of the Bible, of anything can be changed. And if you don't believe me, go to the State Department and look at some of O. Henry's stories, which they are changing drastically. But that's another video. So today, uh, let's start with 310 to Yuma. It was written in March of 53 for um, Dime Western Magazine. And all good literature um, needs to have a compelling storyline, something that we can all enjoy the ride of, and also a relatable character that usually evolves through some type some type of conflict. Um, the three traditional types of conflict are man against man or man against himself. That's one. So man versus man. Uh, man versus nature. Uh, think white fang, things like that. Or um, 
man versus God. There are, so you have the, the storyline and then you have an underlining meaning or a undercurrent of a different story of a deeper meaning for those who want to look for it. Sometimes the author might not intend it, but the reader or the viewer picks up on something, and that's just a grace note that um, God used the artist whether they wanted to be used or not. Um, spoiler alert, we're talking about movies and books. If you haven't read the movie or book um, and you don't want to know how it turns out or the details, then go watch and go read and then come back because we'd love to hear your opinion of it. Um, one of the first things to think about in literature is the naming process. Um, God gave man a part in the creation story, and that was naming. Um, Genesis 2.19 tells us, um, this would be the NLT version, uh, the New Living Translation. He brought them to the man to see what he would call them, and the man chose a name for each one. Um, he brought them, meaning all the wild animals and all the birds of the sky. <clears throat> so what an author chooses to name his characters is important. Um, in this story, Leonard names the deputy Paul Scallon, a good Irish name, and the outlaw is called Joe Kidd. <laughs> Mr. Butterfield, uh, Mr. Shiny Shoes, as Ben Wade calls him in the 2007 movie, is um, named Mr. Timpy in print. But if I hadn't listened to the audio version, I would have pronounced it that way. But the, um, the audio book was performed by Henry Rollins, and Henry Rollins um, pronounced it more Tempe. And of course, that made me think of Tempest, as in Tempest Fugit, Times Flies. Um, that was scrolled on our grandfather clock. I don't think we have a grandfather clock. I think we had a grandmother clock. And don't ask me what the difference is at this particular moment, but I think we had a grandmother clock. Um, and uh, Tempest Fugit is Time Flies. And 310 to Yuma is essentially a short story about a good man, a bad man, and time. They are locked in a room with nothing but time, and time runs out on both of them. So um, that brings me to the second thing that is a consideration in good literature, and that is repetition. And um, before I get into that, let me give you just a basic just uh, overview of the, the story is very sparsely written. It's like the landscape itself, um, which is set in the Arizona desert, and it is um, very sparse. But the more you read it, the more you will get out of it. So I, re I recommend reading it a couple of times. Um, the deputy is from Bisbee, Arizona, and <laughs> of course Bisbee, Arizona comes up in another story called L.A. Confidential. Um, he, but he's from Bisbee, Arizona, and he's transporting a prisoner from Fort Huachuca to the Yuma prison on the 310 train from the town of Contention. Talk about naming something. Um, and the two men have time to kill before the train arrives. So they go up into a hotel room to pass the time. Um, uh, I do have to say that... Uh, Tactically speaking, I think this is a mistake. It, I would have, <laughs> I would have gotten as close to that train as I possibly could. I don't care how uncomfortable I was for how long. I would get the person absolutely as close to that train as possible and push them on at the last possible, uh, you know, at the first possible second. So uh, this whole chase through the town tactically doesn't make sense to me. But again, uh, readers are asked often to suspend their um, you know you, you got to just suspend your disbelief 
and um, you know hey they want to be comfortable in a hotel room until the train arrives and then have to make this run this gauntlet to the um, <laughs> to the train well that's what makes a good story it makes a much better story than mine which I would have been in the actual little depot and just stepped on that train as soon as it arrived um, so both men are very very young uh, the deputy is in his late 20s he's, he's married he's got three children um, and the deputy's in his mid-twenties, and he has to his name a vicious gang who's ready to do anything it can to spring him. Um, I think the story is going to be very slow for action seekers, but it is a microcosm of life. Um, as time passes, uh, more and more, the... Uh, the bad guys work on the townsfolk and more and more they stand down instead of backing up the one good guy who is standing up against the evil in the town. So, you know, talk about a, a story for fifth generation warriors, um, you know, how apropos. So, um, the other thing that's going on is there... <laughs> Also, apropos, there's a psyop going on. The um, the criminal, you know, the Ben Wade character or the Joe Kid character in the short story is working a psyop on the deputy um, who becomes a ranger in the movies, uh, a rancher, excuse me. But <laughs> um, they. Um, He's working on him from so many different angles, like uh, he's trying to appeal to his greed at first, you know, offering him money. He's trying to um, play on the fear that the deputy may have of death or the guilt he feels if he does get killed and abandons his family. Um, and in those days, you know, a female on her own with two children would not have fared very well. Um, so he's, uh, Joe Kidd is trying to manipulate the deputy in order to get him to let him go and not take him to the train. So back to repetition. Um, three times uh, Paul Scallon says to the de to uh, Mr. Shiny Shoes, "Don't tell anybody that I am in contention with Joe Kid. Hold up in an upper hotel room. Don't tell anybody. Don't tell anybody." He says it three times, and of course, what does Mr. Tempe do? But he tells one of uh, Joe Kid's victims. Uh, the brother of one of Joe Kidd's victims that, um, you know, not to feel bad that um, the person who killed his brother is, is under arrest and on his way to prison. Of course, that plays into the story later. Um, another place where we see repetition is with uh, Joe Kidd's right-hand man, whose name is uh, Charlie Prince. Um, and our neuro-linguistic programming tells us that um, this is one of two things. This is either uh, an eligible bachelor of lower royalty or it's um, the Prince of Darkness. Whenever you see Prince, there's, your mind automatically goes to those two things. And of course, in this case, um, he's more aligned with the Prince of Darkness than any um, Prince waiting uh, <laughs> to wake you up from your slumber. <laughs> uh, yeah, there's lots of psyops going on. Anyways, um, so three quotes from the book about Charlie Prince where we see him at three different times doing like essentially the same thing. Um, we see him First of all, we see him pretending to be asleep in the lobby, um, using deceit to spy on the townsfolk and the sheriff and um, see what's uh, the deputy and see what's going on. So there's that first instance where he's using deceit. 
Then we see him lean, quote, leaning idly against a support post, unquote, idly. Um, you know, idle hands are the des devil's wor workshop or um, not doing anything, you know, just lazing, ab l lazing about, but he's in waiting. He's, you know, lurking. It's more like a stalking, lurking type of idleness. Um, another quote is, the man at the post watched the watchers. Um, the man at the post watched. So he's not doing anything, but three times we see him looking, observing, lurking, spying. Um, and then the third quote is leaning against a post. We get it, he's at his post. But, w but what I'm saying is when you see repetition, pay attention to it because um, the author is obviously trying to cement something in your head. Um, the man on duty is watching. He's waiting coolly to make his move. Um, so as far as the citizens go, on an individual level, um, Mr. Tempe backs out. Uh, he whines that, um, you know, he whines, I couldn't help it um, w when the, v the, the brother of one of uh, Joe Kidd's victims um, presses Mr. Tempe. He reveals that the um, sheriff has Joe Kidd under arrest and they're just waiting for the train. Uh, so Mr. Tempe backs out. Um, he, uh, but first he's whining to the deputy that he couldn't help the fact that he spilled the beans to this gentleman who thought he would take the law into his own hands. And that's a pivotal moment in the story because the deputy saves Joe Kidd's life by disarming and defusing the situation with the angry family member so that um, that family member doesn't kill Joe Kidd before he, you know, faces justice in a court of law. But that saving of his life uh, is an important part of the story. Um, so uh, that's what happens on sort of an individual level. And then on the townsfolk level, what we see is the group level. We see, and this is a quote, people would be in the windows and the doors, though you wouldn't see them. They'd have their own feelings, and most of their hearts would be pounding. And they'd edge back of the door frames a little more. The man out on the street, Charlie Prince, was something without a human nature or a personality of its own. He was on a stage. The street was another world. So when faced with evil, um, an otherworldliness, uh, you know, it says it's instead of his. Uh, where is it where they say, you know, the man out on the street, Charlie Prince, was something without a human nature or a personality of its own. Um, so <clears throat> the townsfolk don't have the bravery to stand up to it. It's a terrifying thing. They don't want to die. Um, they don't want to um, lose their life or, or be threatened or have their family threatened or have their um, things taken away from them. They, they don't want to um, face whatever they're going to have to face in order to, they're not, they don't want to pay the price for whatever they have to do to stand up to evil. And uh, unfortunately, as veterans know, there's a very steep price to pay for that freedom. So, you know, the deputy keeps looking at his watch. Um, and 
just as a side note, always wear a watch. Ever notice how stores don't have clocks on the wall? They want you to get into this shopping lull and uh, just waste as much time as you possibly can in the store shop shopping, going around and around, in and up and down the aisles. They want you to spend as much time there as you possibly can, as if you're in a time warp. And the more time you spend, the more you will, the more money you will spend. Um, that's also true in fifth generation war. They want you to lose track of time, um, not do the things, not spend your time wisely. Uh, everything's a competition for your attention. Um, you need to do things that are going to benefit you and benefit your family and um, help you survive and uh, anything that they can do to eat up your time they will so try to always wear a watch um, but it's interesting that you know time is a big part of this story and um, You'll see, especially in the 2007 version of the movie, constantly looking at his watch. <clears throat> another, another note of repetition is the word signs. And um, they're getting very close to transporting Kid to the depot. And three times we see the mention of signs. Uh, quote, two horses stood under a sign that said, eat. Unquote. Quote, on the other side of Stockman Street, the signs continued. End quote. And third, quote, beneath the signs in the shadows, nothing moved. End quote. So what do the signs mean? I mean, they're everywhere. They're bombarding you to eat, to buy. Um, are they signposts of life? Are we reading too much into them? Uh, you could drive yourself crazy. Um, they're just signs of commerce and life. Um, are they part of another world? Because, you know, this is Charlie Prince's world. He was standing under the signs. Um, so just uh, interesting aspects of literature. I, you know, another thing is you don't have to know the definitive answer, but, you know, just appreciate the beauty of all the different things that were included in the story and why they were included. Nothing is, especially in a short story, nothing is included that the author didn't want included. Um, there's very little real estate, uh, very little words, um, very few words, I mean, <coughs> listen to me, I can't even speak English. And every one of them is precious. And so whatever's in there is in there for a reason. So. <clears throat> um, so in the short story, here's how it goes. Um, as Scallon and Joe Kidd are running to the train, Scallon kills Charlie Prince. He gets Jim Kidd on the train. Um, and he lives. <laughs> so on the train, the deputy and the prisoner joke about how Scallon really earns his $150. Uh, in the story, it's $150. Um, I guess with inflation, it goes up to 200 But it, he says, you really earn your $150. And... Um, Scallon laughs and says, yeah, I, I was thinking the same thing. Um, so the good guy kills the bad guy, earns the respect of the middle guy, you know, of the, of the, not, of the bad guy that's not quite gone, that, that has a hope of redemption. Um, also, in case you missed it, Joe Kidd, get it, Kidd, um, you can't think of help, uh, can't help but think about kids in general. So, kids need a good man. 
to lead the way when things get scary. <laughs> Rangers lead the way. Uh, anyways, even bad men need good men in their lives. So, you know, the concept of iron strengthens iron. Um, uh, Joe Kidd is emblematic of a, a kid, a man who, who, is, who is a child in his thinking and approach to life and needs a good man to guide him into true, man, into true manhood. Um, where he's an adult. So you, you have the possibility of redemption there. Um, so just a couple of other side notes about the short story. Um, one is when um, Scallon thinks of his wife and kids. And the reason why this stood out to me is I'm sure many a deployed veteran can relate to this sentiment, but I will quote it directly. He had put them out of his mind, this, his wife and kids. He had put them out of his mind since there was no room now. There was an upset feeling inside as if he had swallowed something that would not go down all the way. It made his heart beat a little faster. Um, the concept of, you know, you can't, there's no brain cells available to think about home and love and the family when you're on a mission and every ounce of your being needs to focus on surviving, uh, accomplishing the mission, mission and coming home yourself and your um, fellow veterans. Um, There was back to that incident where the brother of the victim of Joe Kidd comes into the hotel room, barges into the hotel room and tries to, you know, uh, execute his vigilante justice on Joe Kidd. And um, Deputy Scallon prevents that from happening. And the aftermath of that is really interesting in the short story. It says, after saving kid, you know, this is after saving his life. Um, there's still this interminable wait. And he's sticking to the right course of action. He's still going to take Joe Kid to the train. Sc and this is a quote. Scallon looked at Kid and suddenly felt closer to him than any man he knew. Now that's honesty right there. Um, locked in this mental mortal combat under extreme pressure of time and outside evil forces, Scallon is revealing that he doesn't know why he is continuing and in so doing he finds like a shared humanity with the kid. Um, is Scallon no more capable of choosing his good path than Kid is of choosing his bad path? Um, we don't really know, but it's a really interesting little study there. And it's also indicative of what happens when you're truly honest, you can find humanity with your enemy. If you're truly human, if you truly get to the bare bones of your humanity, you have more in common with your enemies than you might think. So, <clears throat> one last example of the um, concept of repetition is that of fear in this story. Uh, of course, fear is one of the most mentioned um, emotions in the Bible, and the Bible is constantly telling us, fear not. Um, but let's look at this. Um, three instances. The first one is, in less than an hour they would leave the hotel, walk over commercial to Stockman, and then up Stockman to the station. Three blocks. He wanted to go all the way. This is Scanlon now. He wanted to go all the way. He wanted to get Jim Kidd on the train, but he was afraid. Two. Second example. 
And this is another quote. Kid grinned because he knew Scallon was afraid. And the third instance, quote, the others, six of them, were strung out in the dimness of the platform shed, grim-faced, stubbles of beard, hat brims low. The man nearest Prince spat tobacco lazily. Scallon knew fear at that moment, as fear had never gripped him before, but he kept the shotgun hard against Kid's spine. He said, just above a whisper, Jim, I'll cut you in half. It seems like not just fear, but an escalation of fear. Fear in one's own mind, fear recognized by your enemy, and your fear recognized by an army of the enemies. Um, so, there's no way through except to face it and to push through it. Um, facing it and surviving is a rebirth within itself. Um, I guess that's why baptism is a symbolic death and a resurrection. Um, so, again, I don't know if I've mentioned this before or not, but tactically, I think this is a... <laughs> I have to suspend belief to um, allow this story to take place because um, it would... You know, tactically, I think they should go to the depot and no matter how comfortable they are, stay as close to the, the actual train um, landing, the, the spot, the platform where the train is going to stop and that's where they need to be. I would not, I would not spend this, <laughs> I would not spend all this time waiting for the enemy to position himself uh, over the three blocks. Um, but, you know, that wouldn't make a very good story, I guess, so... So let's talk about the 57 movie. Um, changes, uh, changes, changes. Hollywood it just like can never leave a story be. They have to like tinker, tinker, tinker. Um, uh, okay, so now Paul Scallon is uh, christened Dan Evans. Uh, his character is played by Van Heflin. And um, the only thing I can say, <laughs> the only thing I can say about Van Heflin is he reminds me of Walter Coy in The Searchers, who uh, was um, the hu the um, brother of Ethan. Um, and this is a story for another day. But if you watch, if you watch the behind, if you watch The Searchers and look behind the action, you will see a lot of googly eyes between Ethan and Martha. And, um, <laughs> well, uh, as unchristian as it is to say, there is, you know, the, the Van Heflin um, casting of Van Heflin in this role is indicative of the good guy is not the handsome leading man who's flashy. He's the stable, maybe not so handsome guy. And um, we can talk about the searchers another day. Uh, and of course, Joe Kidd is now Ben Wade. Um, and in the 1957 version of 310 to Yuma, he is played by the it man um, of his generation, which is Glenn Ford. Whew. <laughs> um, Glenn Ford was, is probably on a Brad Pitt type um, level of, our, of this generation. Um, so the movies are very similar, but they're very different in other ways. So just to reiterate Dan and his wife are struggling the ranch that they run is um, there's a lot of drought dead cattle um, things are hard uh, and that's pressure on the marriage and 
you know, pressure on a, ma on, on a marriage will either make a diamond or it'll crush the relationship. Um, you know, you get the feeling that she's running out of the belief that things will get better. Um, you know, she's kind of parroting what he's saying, but you get the sense that she's not really believing it. Um, yeah, think, absolutely things will get better. You know, and she's, you can, t you can tell she's not really believing it. Um, and by the way, as an aside, that's a fact, Jack. Um, <laughs> that's from a movie. Um, women are statistically much more likely to become disillusioned with a relationship. Um, and so, gentlemen, uh, foreplay begins from the moment lovemaking ends. That's how you nip that in the bud. Um, so we also see that Ben Wade is very smooth with the ladies, um, both the barmaid he beds and through the pleasant trees that he exchanges with Mrs. Evans at dinner. Um, now this was not a stretch for Glenn Ford, but we'll get back to that. Um, so other than seeing the actual robbery, um, seeing Alice and the boys at the ranch, the plot essentially remains true to Leonard's short story. Uh, Evans kills Charlie Prince um, and gets Wade on the train. At one point during the shootout at the train, Evans asks Wade how he can know that Wade will keep his word to jump on the train with him. And Wade says that Evans is just going to have to trust him. And we learn that he essentially puts himself on the train, you know, he jumps on the train himself um, because Evans saved his life. Um, so when when Evans saves his life in the hotel room from the vengeful family member who lost a brother to Ben Wade, that registered with Ben Wade and he repaid the favor by putting himself on the train, by jumping on the train. <clears throat> he doesn't like owing anybody any favors. I think that's... Um, it's also very um, horrible feeling to have to owe somebody your life. Um, if you know anything about Hollywood, you know that this is the proverbial era of the black hat versus the white hat. <clears throat> um, the audience expected that a white hat was a good guy or a potentially good guy and black hats were bad guys. Um, and Wade wears a white hat in this story. <laughs> so, um, and uh, there's interviews out there on YouTube, you can find them of uh, when they did This Is Your Life for Glenn Ford. And he tells the story about how uh, someone stole his hat that he wore in many movies, his white hat that he wore in 310 to Yuma and other stories and, and other movies. And uh, it was stolen and somebody made a gift of giving him another one. Um, but it's just, uh, is he bad? Yes. Does he have a... Um, does he wear a white hat? Do you know he's going to do the right thing in the end? Yes. Um, so the good wins out in the character that is conflicted. Um, <laughs> and then 
as the train is driving away, Ben Wade is waving to his wife who came to town to, su to support him, to be the only voice of support. And as the train is driving away with the two men headed to Yuma prison, she's on a buckboard waving to him and he's waving to her and it starts raining and the ranch is going to be saved the cattle will have water all's well that ends well when you stand up to evil and do the right thing and the, even the bad guy has the potential of redemption um so um you know it's very neatly packaged you know you face your fear you stick with your family god sends the healing rain roll the credits um but you also see a very subtle shift now in the hollywood version because uh you know we did have a fling with the barmaid um, but he redeems himself so he's a um, forgiven person or a uh, redeemed person um, very close to real life for Glenn Ford very close to and we'll get to that at the end so 2007 movie moving right along um okay the 2007 movie gets real in a horridly fatalistic european way um but with quintessentially american twists um we see dan evans making decisions without his wife's input and essentially lies to her uh, he claims that he paid um, the money, um, the, <laughs> if you understand Western history, there was a lot of range wars, and the range wars were men who dammed water so that downstream ranchers couldn't get access to water for their cattle, and it basically drove them off the land and um they would have to pay rent uh, eventually you know waterways were not allowed to be dammed but um this was an era before those laws came into effect and and dan's essentially being squeezed off his land and he says he paid the rent for the water access when in actuality he paid them he bought um feed and um medicine for their very sick son uh, you know it doesn't matter that you know he says would you have decided any differently and of course she wouldn't but we see the modern version of the breakdown in communication within the family um, so uh, <laughs> but we also can read that as he's being cut off from his living water um, by the town tyrant um, so because Dan can't get water his grass is dried up his cattle are dying uh, his barn is burned by th these people um, who are trying to push him out uh, and he's a veteran of the Union Army during the Civil War. Um, and he lost a foot under a friendly fire incident. So let's see, we kind of have a veteran message there. Try, veterans try hard, but they're star-crossed with success. They have rocky relationships at best. They lie, they are not heroes, and they don't have gallant stories to tell. Um, but it gets worse. And this is not to say that this is not a good movie. It's a great movie. It's a great movie. But you have to be aware of the messaging 
so that you don't let it blindside you. Um, no more being blindsided by people who are trying to lie to us. Um, <clears throat> so Wade is still smooth with the ladies. And, um, you know, in this one, I have to say that the barmaid makes a huge tactical error when he says, you know, let's jump right through that window and uh, take off to Mexico. I'm not wanted in Mexico. And why she doesn't say yes is beyond me because... You know, how many offers would she get in that dusty, dry town, um, you know, to go shinnying down on, <laughs> shinnying down to Mexico on Ben Wade's arm? She should have done it. Um, but anyways, that's another story. Um, they could have made a lot, they could have made a good couple, you know? Uh, and at least she would have had some, you know, uh, life in her life, you know, there would have been some um, excitement and love in her life. Uh, she was wasting away in that um, bar simply because she probably had tuberculosis, but that's another story. Um, however, that offer also shows us something about Wade. It shows us that he wants to escape too. And he wants to escape his gang, his life, the being an outlaw. He wants out of that. And if she had said yes, she could have possibly saved him from that life. Um, so just one more reason why she should have said yes. Um, so there's something that um, in this movie version, we see a nod to Elmore Leonard's characterization of Joe Kidd as being very observant. Repeatedly, uh, Elmore Leonard talks about uh, Joe Kidd watching and observing and studying people and situations um, and that the filmmakers give a nod to that by uh, showing Wade's character as someone who sketches and he always sketches something he admires so we see him sketching the hawk and we see um, Charlie Prince ride up and scare the hawk off and we see how frustrated and irritated Ben Wade is and how he doesn't express it um, but he's pissed off that that happened we see him sketching you know the beautiful body of the barmaid and how lovely she is um, and we also see him sketching Ben Wade so we see his uh, observation qualities and his studying qualities as situational awareness is is uh, given a nod in this in this movie by the fact that he actually sketches so I thought that was a nice little nod to the original story um, <coughs> so in this version Wade wears a black hat <laughs> and uh, it's war, you know, that should be a tip off that this is going to be a different version of 310 to Yuma. So, um, gone are there days where black was black and white was white. Uh, now we're going to see um, good is bad and bad is good. Um, we see Wade save Dan from an Indian ta attack. Um, which he claims was just to get out of the territory alive. Um, you also get the feeling that bad is keeping good in the fight just to have something to push against. It's kind of odd. It's like uh, Wade is 
God at the at the end it's very obvious but at the all along we see that um, Dan Evans in this version is a feckless version he, he's <laughs> well let's continue um, he's always needing to be bailed out um, by his son um, <clears throat> So we do we we see we see a very split Wade. So we see him to two very beautiful things. One is he chooses not to strangle Evans. At one point where they're running to the train, um, Wade gets the jump on Evans and tries to um, strangle him, and that's where. Um, Wade confesses that he has he's not a hero and he he's embarrassed to tell his war story to his children he's never been a hero um and Ben Wade is like okay come on you can be the hero I'll put myself on the train but I'm dragging your ass with me to make it look like you're putting me on the train it was it's so obvious at this point um, that bad is keeping good in the fight or um, it's just not as, um, it's a much more complex story than either the short story or the 57 version of the movie. Um, so the other thing that uh, the other really g beautiful thing that Wade does is he tells Wade, uh, Evans' son, Will, that um, he is bad. That he wouldn't be able to lead a gang like this if he wasn't bad. And don't idolize, you know, like... you. He, he basically convinces Evans' son, Will, not to idolize him. And Will's son is a teenager, and he idolizes the outlaw and the outlaw life, and Wade dissuades him of that. And that's a really beautiful thing because it basically gives Evans back his son and keeps him on the, on the side of right. Because under... Um, other circumstances, Wade might have brought him into the gang. He could have gotten worse and worse and worse as a person. So, um, whether that's a nod to, whether that's doing something right to do something right, or whether it's just a nod to Ben Wade to, um, a, a respect out of respect for Ben Wade to m make sure that his son doesn't idolize the outlaw life. So speaking of Will, he's a amazing hothead, uh, and yet <laughs> this is my this is why you need hotheads because he saves the day uh, repeatedly. Um, you know, where when his father seems feckless, um, he 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 shows himself as having snuck out and followed this um you know this uh push to contention um to wait for the train um he was supposed to stay home and take care of the ranch and of course he escapes and doesn't and follows them and makes his appearance when his father loses the jump on ben wade and you know trains a gun on him and uh allows his father time to reestablish the right order. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, there's a serious edge to the kid. He's not 100% good, uh, but he's a teenager. And, you know, the messaging couldn't be clearer that if you're going to go after a bad guy, you almost have to be prepared to be bad. Um,
but the 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 kid is testing he's just testing he's testing waters he could go in either direction and what he really needs is strong guidance and he's got two men who he could follow and one of his one is his father who's trying to do the right thing and the other is an outlaw who's not trying to do the right thing and this is why the influence of the father is so very important in the in the family um, so psychologically it gets very twisted but it's a the, the messaging is complex and there's many layers but that makes for interesting art and it's a great movie and I do highly recommend it I just there are things about it that especially veterans um, and especially fifth generation warriors should be aware of as they're watching it <coughs> which brings me to some really dark aspects um, not only of Wade but of what humans will do to other humans. First, Wade kills one of the deputies transporting him with a, wait for it, a fork. Get it? Like he's done? Stick a fork in him? Uh, it, it, it would be humorous <laughs> if you... <laughs> um, he also kills one of his own men for not ensuring that the deputy on the stagecoach was dead. Um, You know, and we see him using very similar lines on Alice when they're at the house having dinner that he used on the barmaid. So he's trying to win her over. I don't think that he thinks that he can bed her, so to speak, but he wins her over. Um, and of course, Alice being in a compromised position, you know, stressed out of her mind with the familial situation a sick son a dying ranch a you know a crippled husband who is having trouble keeping the ranch going um you know <laughs> the women always fall for the talking snake you know that's all there is to it he's a snake and he's trying to use the same maneuvers that he used on the barmaid on alice and the, the, the line that kills me is that, um, you know, Dan catches her sort of, you know, he's not what I thought. Um, and he said, for God's sake, Alice, he's killed more men than the drought. And um, it's just a humorous line. Um, but Wade makes a, a woman feel special. And that's what they're falling for um so in this 2007 version we see the dark side of um when wade is electrocuted abu Ghraib style um the pictures of those real life torture sessions were in our collective consciousness starting in 2004 which is the same year that this collection of westerns came out um <clears throat> the movie scene is eerily rep uh, reminiscent of those images um, and this is this is the extremely hyped up version of um, the man who lost his brother to Ben Wade has a posse and has caught these guys on their travel from Evans's house to contention um, <clears throat> and they electrocute him and the veterinarian who is traveling with the good guys is the one who knocks out one of the torturers with a shovel um, and of course he's shot trying to get away once they free Wade and the message is clear, you will die if you go up against this level of evil. But hey, it was a good death, you know. Um, uh, we also see 
Dan Evans lying to the uh, veterinarian as he's dying, you know, telling him that, you know, everything's going to be okay, that they made it, that they're, that they're free. And we see that repeated at the train when Will is talking to his father. Um, you know, I never tell you lies, but I tell you stories. The ending. My gosh, I don't even know where to start, but um, Wade manages to get himself on the train, <coughs> dragging Evans with him. Um, it's really obvious in this case. We've, we've seen that the... the um, we've seen the shift. The bad guy is in charge when he frees Evans from the moment when he was going to strangle him to death. From that point on, he is essentially dragging Evans to the train with him. So the bad guy is keeping the good guy in the fight all the way up to the train. Uh, there's lots of heady um, exchanges and stories. Um, but essentially, the Prince of Dark Charlie Prince of Darkness shoots Dan Evans in the back once he gets Wade on the train. Um, and Wade is so pissed that he jumps off the train and kills his entire gang. Um, Will raises his gun to Wade, but can't kill him. So that's a victory that Will is not a killer. He's not going to kill the man who caused his father's death. Um, and Wade gets on the train, puts himself on the train, and then whistles for his horse, which is a nice little touch. Uh, <laughs> you know, his, his horse, he's going to jump on his horse and never get to Yuma prison. Um, so... Here's your message. You go up against bad guys and you'll be cut down. Interestingly, in the short story, the sound of the train mimics the sound of Scallon's hard breathing and racing heart and life. And in the 2007 movie, the train sounds mimic the sounds of Evan's fading breath and slowing heart and death. So they've taken this story and twisted it on its head. It's a great movie, but you need to be aware of it. So there's some interesting side notes that we should delve into just to round out the story and of course to get back to Glenn Ford. Um, <clears throat> um, So this is not just a reference to an Arizona town and, a, and any old train. It's a reference to a specific time and a specific place um, and a specific train at a specific time. So all of the chapter 3 verse 10s in the Bible, the only one that applies to the story is in Revelations 3.10. Quote, because you have obeyed my command to persevere, I will protect you from the great time of testing that will come upon the whole world to test those who belong to this world. So, uh, interesting. And what does Charlie Prince do to the decoy that he catches in the stagecoats? He burns them, sets them on fire, alive. Um, Dan negotiates with Butterfield, Mr. Shiny Shoes, to give Alice a thousand dollars and to ensure that the water flows on his land. So we know that at least the widows and orphans will be taken care of, which is a biblical principle. But there are two highly traumatizing 
sub messages. The first is that in one of those stories that Wade, you know, there's a lot of talking between Wade and um, Evans. I mean, um, yeah, Wade and Evans. And Wade tells the story that his mother abandoned him at the train, at the train station, ironically, and told him to read the Bible. And he was a very good boy, and he stayed there for three days reading the Bible from cover to cover. His mother never came back. Uh, is that part of his psychology with women? Uh, is that part of his psychology period um, and his life choices? So what do we do with children who have been subjected to abuse at the hands of a church or a Christian? Uh, is that abandonment church connection potentially traumatizing to victims who see this movie? Um, I'm only theorizing. It's, it's just simply up to us to be aware of these things and to keep them in mind. Um, the second and equally disturbing message is something that Dan said about being paid by the government for the loss of his leg. They didn't pay me Quote, they didn't pay me so I'd walk away. They'd pay me so they could walk away. And what do veterans do? They sacrifice themselves for the mission. And if you don't die, you keep sacrificing yourself for the mission until you do. Even if by your own decision. Um, we can argue whether suicide is programmed into the training, but deprogramming the program and you will see behind the curtain and it will not no longer have control over you it's a lot easier if we all stand up together against evil um, doing it by ourselves is unbelievably terrifying so two last notes What is this unrequited love uh, bromance between Charlie and Wade? Um, in the 2007 movie, when one of the gang members points out that contention is 80 miles in the opposite direction, uh, that Wade got himself arrested by dallying with the barmaid and that they'd have to kill their horses to reach him, Charlie doesn't want to hear anything about it. Um, and he definitely acts jealous when Wade is eyeing the barmaid. Um, you can read too much into something, that's definitely possible, but you also have to be very aware um, that, that artists, including filmmakers, are very deliberate about the details that they include. Um, sometimes there's grace notes, but um, <clears throat> what they include and what they don't include is very deliberate um, so this there is a same-sex something going on there and Wade is not participating in it it's all coming from Charlie Prince, Prince of Darkness isn't that interesting <coughs> and finally Glenn Ford Glenn Ford served in World War two and Vietnam um, while the country held a uh, neutral position in mid-1941, he entered the Coast Guard Auxiliary. And you could laugh at that all you want, but he was an actor and he joined. Uh, he had a deferment because his mom, he, he was his mom's only means of support. Uh, by December of 42, he had entered the U.S. Marine Corps Reserves knowing that he ran the risk of um, never recovering his career. During this time, he married a woman named Eleanor Powell, and she was a quite the dancer. Um, she did what was customary at the, at the time, and she gave up her career and um, moved with Glenn to be close to wherever he was um, serving at and the deal was you know the intention was was to raise a family 
Um, so in a, this is very telling. This is very telling, and veterans will will see this right away. Uh, <clears throat> because he had Coast Guard auxiliary experience, he was offered a commission, and he turned it down. He feared it would be perceived as preferential treatment toward a movie star. He started his active service as a private. He never saw combat and that bothered him, but he worked with Tyrone Power on radio programs and acted in training and other military oriented videos, I mean movies. He was medically discharged for ulcers around the time of his son's pending birth. But he served in the Naval Reserves well into Vietnam War and attained the rank of captain. And uh, that's colonels to us, Luddites. Um, so his wife sacrificed her career for her man, but at some point she focused solely on her son. Now which came first, we don't know. Um, Ford was a womanizer, and there's no two ways about it. Uh, it could be that Powell turned into a child-centric existence to ease her own pain. Um, it could have been that trouble was in the relationship for some time, which precipitated Ford stepping out. Um, many accounts, and you can see this in YouTube videos and biographies, um, say that Ford stayed in the marriage too long. He tried to do the right thing by her to make it work in some way, shape, or form for, pro for propriety's sake. Uh, but the couple lived on separate floors of their home and they lived separate lives. Um, and he remained a womanizer for the rest of his life, which got creepier and creepier as he got older with one exception that is crucial to understand. He had the grave misfortune of falling in love with a wildly beautiful and fatally flawed redhead who had been sexually molested by her father at a very young age. How Hollywood. Ford loved her with all of his being for 40 years and she loved him back for all those years until her death. But they were simply too broken to make it work. Uh, if you watch him on This Is Your Life, you will see him desperately trying to explain how much he loved her from the first moment of closeness they shared on screen. It's so easy to sit in judgment, but I see two terribly flawed human beings who shared 40 years spending as much time as they possibly could with each other, but never being able to sustain a committed relationship. They lived beside each other for decades, and he cut a door in his fence so that she could come over anytime she wanted without people talking. He was like protecting her reputation. Um, they even and married and divorced other people, uh, but they never stopped loving each other. They spent almost every day together. And I don't know what you do with that. How do you stand in judgment of that? As my father once said, you have to make allowances for some things. One of those things is not labeling as sinners two hypersexualized people who were most likely victims of that nameless program we know only as Monarch. And that woman was Rita Hayworth. So Merry Christmas and until next time, uh, enjoy your eggnog, whether it is <laughs> bourbon laced or whether it is um, virgin. 